Cookie Cutter is a combat-focused metroidvania featuring super cool character animation, turbo ultra chaotic combat and a humanoid robot protagonist named Cherry who herself has got another robot companion called Regina who looks like a... you know. Two plus two equals vagina. While the game looks absolutely stunning and the animations look incredibly detailed, it does have its share of flaws, some minor and some fatal. For example, the opening cutscene and the conversation and tutorial that follows it are all fully voiced. Don't be shy to defeat any potential threat. But the rest of the game after the tutorial is just plain text. Is it some kind of a bug? Maybe. But the fact that it didn't get fixed even after a post-launch patch led me to believe that it's a feature and a bizarre one at that. So let's get the basics out of the way. You're an android created by Shinji, a scientist who apparently created you to have a romantic relationship with you. Weird, weird. This Marilyn Manson looking evil corporation type guy kidnaps Shinji and his two henchmen called dickheads Literally. beat you to a pulp. This guy Raz picks up your remains and fixes you and now you must find your way to the evil corporation Marilyn Manson guy and rescue your creator slash lover Shinji. Beyond this, I didn't really pay much attention to the story, partly due to that glitch slash bug of voice acting vanishing out of nowhere and partly because the game builds a lot of his world through text readable in terminals you can find all over. And I'm not a big fan of reading in games. I was elected to lead, not to read. It's a metroidvania, so it has all the typical metroidvania stuff in it, like upgrades, switchable perks, hidden stashes, side quests with characters that eventually become merchants, bosses and everything else. The only notable thing in the combat system is that it has a parry mechanic. The enemies flash a warning right before initiating a parryable strike and you have to press a dedicated parry button at the right moment. The usual fare. It's fun, but the timing is kind of tricky and sometimes it's hard to tell how far you have to stand from the enemy to be able to parry them successfully. I actually like that the game takes a rather safe approach in its design in that it borrows pretty much every aspect of its traversal abilities, healing, level design, perks, upgrades etc from other popular games of the genre. This is by no means a cheap out though as the developers have clearly put some genuine effort into implementing all these in their game which is why I didn't mind it at all. I also kind of like the fact that during about 90% of my playthrough the game felt kind of non-linear although the map always pointed to one singular objective that I'm supposed to go to. The overwhelming amount of optional areas to discover, hidden chests to find, never let the exploration get dull for me. But still, I wouldn't call this game an exploration focused one, rather combat is very clearly its main focus. Even platforming challenges kind of take a backseat, only encountered sparingly, mostly in optional areas. That's actually great because to me platforming here felt more frustrating than enjoyable. Combat with its punchy sound design and super cool animation feels great, as long as you're not locked in a room fighting hordes of enemies. Then you'd really struggle to see what's happening. This is caused by a number of design choices which I assume made it to the final game due to lack of enough playtesting. Cherry is shorter than virtually every enemy, making it very difficult to see her when she is swarmed by taller enemies. When she takes damage, she blinks for too long which in turn makes it very difficult to keep track of her position in the heat of the battle. When the enemies bleed, they bleed too much, making the fighting area too noisy to read. All these, together with very detailed character models, attack and damage animations, and overdone VFX make you virtually blind during combat sections where you are locked in a room and the only way to progress is to kill hordes of enemies that spawn in multiple rounds. These lockdown sessions happen very frequently in the game, so dying repeatedly in these simply because you can't see what you're doing feels grossly unfair. The fact that the camera is generally very zoomed out only exasperates the problem. Keeping up with the amazing visual design of the rest of the game, the bosses are visually spectacular. But unfortunately, they only have very predictable small set of moves that they keep repeating in the same sequence, making the fights very easy. Moreover, I found that instead of hitting them with your regular kicks and other offensive abilities and damaging their health bar gradually, it's much easier and faster to quickly learn their parry timing in 2-3 to three attempts and just waiting till they try to strike you with a parryable attack and parrying them about 3 to 4 times to bring up the prompt for the finishing move and be done with it. This strategy, which felt more like a cheesing technique, worked on every single boss, so overall boss fights felt very underwhelming. 
It's a real shame because I actually really like the game as a whole. Despite lack of any real innovation, the extremely eye-catching animation, the adequate level design and great music kept me engaged throughout my roughly 20 hours playthrough. Unfortunately, the frustratingly over-animated combat significantly hurt my experience. But the simple yet visually pleasing level design kept me interested enough to want to overcome the somewhat unfair feeling combat zones. Would I still recommend it? Yes. Because despite all its drawbacks, it's still a good enough product for its price that I think you shouldn't miss if you're a fan of the genre.